everyone. Thank you all for being here again and participating today in this CSI PBO webinar on gravity. So today we have with us uh, Raisa Mende. Raisa is currently a professor at the Federal Fluminense University in Brazil. In the most recent years, she has been dedicated to the study of astrophysical tests in general relativity and modified gravity theories, including topics such as pulsar time, time, time sorry, and gravitation wave stereoseismology. She got her PhD in physics from Sao Paulo State University, Brazil, under the supervision of Professor George Matzas. Uh, she then moved on to a postdoc at the University of Gell in Canada with a fellowship from the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Since uh, 2000, 2017, she has been working at the Physics Institute of Federal, Federal Feminine University. So today, she will talk about neutron star and screen mechanisms. Go ahead, Raisa. Thank you, Miguel. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you. I guess uh, everything has its bright side and a nice aspect of this uh, pandemic is that distances suddenly feel much more relative, right? So it is a great pleasure to be talking to you in Italy from Brazil. Uh, so the topic of this talk is uh, neutron stars and screening mechanisms. And this is based on this recent paper uh, with Bernardo Aguiar, uh, who just finished his master's uh, thesis. So the idea here is to explore some possible extreme properties that neutron stars may have, uh, which make them interesting laboratories uh, for us to probe uh, scalar tensor extensions of general relativity and in particular theories with uh, screening mechanisms. So this is the general outline of the talk. I'll begin with some general words on neutron stars and then I'll discuss the features that we want to explore. Um, then I'll give this brief introduction, brief account of the models that we want to consider. And finally, I'll discuss some of our results and perspectives for future work. Okay, so let's, let's start. Uh, neutron stars are these really amazing objects, right? The most compact material objects we know of in nature. And because neutron stars are so compact, uh, this fact has some remarkable consequences, right? The first is their rich microphysics. Uh, neutron stars, they populate this interesting and poorly understood corner of the QCD phase diagram, uh, characterized by densities far, far higher than the nuclear uh, saturation density. So if we do a quick back of the envelope calculation, we can see that at around uh, four times the nuclear saturation density, uh, neutrons in the stellar interior would start geometrically overlapping, so that at this extreme densities, matter may not be composed of nucleons alone, but may contain a variety of other hadronic degrees of freedom. So in order to compute a neutron star approximation schemes can be used. Uh, since the problem is intractable from first principles. And this gives rise to a wealth of prediction for the for the nuclear equation of state. And as you all know, nowadays and properties of neutron stars can actually provide, the, provide us with unexpected uh, and unique ways to probe general relativity. And uh, for this, I'll, I'll dwell a little, a little bit on a specific property that neutron stars may have uh, that make them interesting laboratories to probe these uh, theories with screening mechanisms, uh, which, which again is the focus of, of the, the talk. So as I was saying, this uh, extreme conditions in the neutron star interior may provide uh, uh, a unique environment to probe these extensions of general relativity. And just to give an example of such extreme properties, uh, it can be shown that neutron star mass measurements uh, uh, constrain, actually they exclude 
a maximum speed of sound inside neutron stars of less than about 0 0.6. And actually, a larger values closer to the speed of light are indeed preferred by these observations. So here, I will be interested in a somewhat related but not quite the same property, uh, that the pressure in the neutron star interior uh, could exceed one third of the energy density so that the trace of the energy momentum tensor uh, uh, becomes positive in a region of the stellar interior. And the reason uh, why this property may be interesting is that in several scalar extensions of general relativity, the scalar field couples to the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And then new phenomenology may arise when the trace changes sign. But before discussing uh, this new phenomenology, uh, it's worthwhile to ask some basic questions. Uh, so first, whether this condition is really physical. And it, it is interesting that for some time, until the 60s, it was thought that just from special relativity it should follow that the trace is always less or equal to zero. So I can maybe read a little bit from this quote by Zadovich in a paper of uh, 62. So he says that the ground advance for this is that, of course, for the electromagnetic field, uh, the energy density is equal to three times the pressure. And for free non-interacting particles, we have uh, uh, pressure always less than one third of the energy density. And then in this paper, Zadovich proceeds to, to criticize this, this uh, view and to explicitly construct an example of a relativistic causal theory in, in which the trace uh, is positive. And today we know that uh, the trace can often be positive for strongly interacting systems like the one constructed by Zadovich. And in all places in nature, neutron stars seem really ideal uh, to look for that. So the next question uh, we can ask is whether this trace condition is really realized in nature, right? This is a crucial question. And the answer to this one is, is still unclear because it relies on knowledge of the nuclear equation of state uh, close to the maximum allowed uh, densities, which is still unknown. So a couple of years ago, together with Eric Poisson and, and Dylan, a master's student, uh, we published this work trying to correlate this microscopic condition uh, to macroscopic properties of neutron stars. So here I'm showing some mass uh, radius diagrams uh, for over uh, 100 causal equations of state. And in orange, what you can see are configurations uh, where the trace is negative in the entire star, while in blue, you can see configurations where the trace is positive in some region of the stellar interior. So you can see from this plot that this happens for the most massive, most compact neutron stars predicted by many, but not all equations of state. You can see that some equations of state uh, do not quite reach that point. Uh, so, so from this plot, you can also see that although there is no clear correlation between this property and a specific value for mass or radius, there is this sharp uh, correlation to the neutron star compactness. So in this work, uh, we quantify this better and, uh, and, and see that the, the critical pressure for which this pressure dominated phase appears in the neutron star interior is of the order of uh, 0.262, which is this red line in the plot. Uh, so since today, there is still much uncertainty in measurements of the neutron star radius and also the compactness. Uh, we can't really say it's un unclear whether this condition is truly, truly realized in nature. But from we now, what we now know, uh, there is no reason to, to discard this possibility. So I think it's interesting to consider what happens if the systems really are detected. Okay, so let me proceed and discuss what interesting things uh, could happen in such scenario. And here I will focus on this very simple class of scalar tensor theories which nonetheless provides us with a very rich and diverse phenomenology. So from Brunswick theory to a non-minimally coupled Higgs field that could act as the inflaton to the symmetron or chameleon model for dark energy, they all can be ca cast in this, in this form. Uh, so in this action, we have uh, two free functions of the scalar field, the potential and this conformal coupling. Uh, note that the matter fields here denoted by the psi, they couple to this combination between the scalar field uh, and the metric. Uh, and this conformal coupling is ultimately related to the non-minimal coupling between the metric and scalar sector, which becomes more uh, evident when we rewrite this in the, in the Jordan frame. 
So if we derive the scalar field from this, from this action, we see that it features this coupling to the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And in this work, we are going to discuss what kind of new phenomenology uh, can arise when this trace changes sign, focusing on theories that display these screening mechanisms. Uh, but before showing you some, some results, uh, I wanted to first give like a brief introduction to these specific models that we are going to, to study. Um, so first, just a, a general motivation, right? So if we consider a distance scale, uh, we know that general relativity is extremely well tested on solar system scales, say from, from uh, a micrometer, uh, which is probed by, for instance, atom interferometry experiments that probe Newton's law for gravitation, uh, to those solar system scales of the order, say, of one uh, astronomical unit. Beyond that, we are forced to include these mysterious dark components to explain uh, astrophysical and cosmological observations. And we also know that in the other extreme, uh, for very small distances, it is uh, widely believed, at least, that general relativity should acquire UV corrections. And as we appro approach the, Plan the Planck scale, uh, general relativity should ultimately be replaced by some theory of quantum gravity. So when we are trying to connect these unknowns and ask whether high energy modifications to general relativity uh, could also give some more natural explanations for dark energy say. We always face the difficulty of imposing the solar system constraints that force the theory to agree with general relativity very well at solar system scales, but nonetheless we still want uh, to predict something very different from GR at larger scales, right? Uh, and the way this is usually performed is uh, by some sort of screening mechanism. These mechanisms, they are going typically to enforce uh, an environmental dependence on, of the field properties. And there are several uh, screening mechanisms in the literature, uh, but perhaps we can classify them as chameleon-like or of the chameleon type and Weinstein-like. Uh, and I know that many of you are, are looking at Weinstein-like uh, screening uh, for k essence, for instance, and have very interesting uh, recent results. Um, uh, this, this, of course, relies on the, the existence of these derivative self-couplings involving uh, 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 derivatives and of a scalar field. And these nonlinear self-couplings, they become important as density increases so around the sources in high-density environments. Uh, and this leads to the suppression of the coupling to matter. And although this is very interesting, uh, here I'm going to focus on chameleon-like screening, uh, which operates uh, not only in the original chameleon model of Weltman Kuhi, but also on a, on a variety of other models like F of R, uh, some gelatin models, the symmetry model, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, this chameleon type uh, theories, uh, they can be written in the form that I presented to you before. The scalar field is going to evolve under the influence of this effective potential, and this depends on the model functions and on the local density through the trace of the energy momentum tensor. So the idea behind uh, different screening models is then to choose these model functions carefully so that the scalar field is suppressed in high density environments, uh, such as the Earth or the solar system, uh, but is let free to mediate this long range interaction uh, at larger cosmological scales. So let me briefly uh, recall what's the general idea behind chameleon-like screening. So for that, let us imagine this Newtonian uh, non-relativistic mass distribution uh, with mass m radius r. Uh, and we want to understand what's the behavior of the scalar field outside of the source, which I'm illustrating here, trying to illustrate by this density plot. So far away from the star, the scalar field is going to settle to some constant value which uh, when we look uh, at the field equations, uh, for phi to be constant, this should correspond to an extremum of the effective potential. Of the effective potential. And in the Newtonian limits, then it can be shown that uh, outside the source, the field can be written this way, uh, where uh, we have this uh, effective coupling to matter, uh, the effective mass, which is just defined as the second derivative of the effective potential. And this function f basically is determined by matching this external solution to the internal solution, right? So in order to suppress uh, fifth force effects related to the presence of this uh, scalar field, uh, these fifth, fifth forces are, are proportional to the field gradient, right? Uh, when, so what one either needs the effective mass to be large, uh, this effective coupling to be small, or this function f to be small. 
and different uh, uh, screening models implement this in different ways. Uh, the chameleon model, in its original form, uh, it combines this uh, uh, power law potential with an exponential Brunswick like uh, conformal coupling in such a way that at densities, uh, at high densities, the effective potential has a large curvature around its minimum, so the field is, is massive at high densities. And at low densities, the curvature around the minimum of the effective potential is, is lower. So the effective mass is, uh, in, uh, depends on the ambient density. And in the chameleon model, uh, besides that, uh, we also have this so-called uh, thin shell mechanism. Uh, you're going to see this uh, in, um, in, uh, in solutions that are in plots that I'm showing, I'm going to show later. Um, but which, which basically uh, consists in the following. So in high density environments, the scalar field is going to be almost constant inside the star. And it's just, the gradient's just going to differ from zero around this thin shell surrounding the body. So that this function f uh, just receives contribution from this thin shell of matter and is therefore also suppressed. So besides the, the chameleon model, some uh, string-inspired uh, dilaton model can also display screening. So in this work, we are going to consider this environmentally dependent dilaton, dilaton model, which was formulated in the paper by in this paper by Brax et al. Um, it is a string-inspired model with a coupling function uh, that is quadratic and has therefore a minimum. This is supposed to be valid around the minimum of this coupling function. And this model with no potential was put forth uh, by the and Polyakov in the 90s, uh, where they show that this massless uh, string dilaton uh, can be cosmologically attracted towards values where it decouples from matter and therefore avoids experimental bounds. So it has been considered more recently with this exponential potential uh, in such a way that again we have an effective potential that depends on the local uh, uh, density uh, content. Um, so screening in this model is implemented by making the minimum of the effective potential that, so this plot is the effective potential as a function of psi, the minimum is indicated by the black dots. Uh, so the way the screening operates here is that in high density environments, the minimum of the effective potential is drawn towards the minimum of this uh, conformal coupling, which for this plot is located at zero. Uh, so that this first term, this coupling to matter, is suppressed. And in this Dilaton model, we also have uh, some, the same sort of uh, thin shell mechanism. The scalar field is, is constant inside, uh, almost constant inside uh, high density sources. Uh, similarly, we have other models like uh, the Symmetron model that also rely on this environmental dependence of the conformal coupling. So interesting models with screening are then those where the model parameters can be tuned so that screening occurs for typical solar system densities, but still at cosmological scales, the field can contrib contribute uh, significantly to dark energy. So to probe uh, these models, one usually looks for low density unscreened environments, right? Uh, so for instance, in this atom interferometry experiments, they use these uh, high vacuum chambers uh, to simulate cosmological conditions. Or we can think about astrophysical observations of, of some uh, dwarf galaxies located in voids. Uh, so we, we typically look for uh, low density unscreened environments. On the other hand, it's typically understood that high density environments would automatically be self-screened. So the idea of this work is to connect with what I discussed in the first part and ask whether neutron stars, uh, which are the densest place, uh, places in nature, uh, could actually uh, uh, be added to this list, right? And provide additional laboratories to probe uh, this series. Okay, so uh, just to connect, so I'm going to come to the to results and I, I'm going to, to basically discuss the results. I'm not going to put uh, many technical details here, but please feel free to ask me later anything you want to, to know about the work. I just want, didn't want to bother you with many, many equations. So as we saw before, uh, we have this effective potential uh, that has this coupling to the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And for a perfect fluid, as we saw in the first part, uh, the trace is equal to three times the pressure minus the energy density. And when we go to the Newtonian limit, uh, the trace uh, is dominated 
by the rest mass contribution to the energy density, while the density of internal energy and the pressure just give uh, subdominant contributions. However, as density builds up, this uh, picture can change. So this plot here shows uh, the trace as a function of, of the radio coordinate for the most massive neutron star uh, predicted by these four uh, realistic equations of state. So as we go from the radius of the star towards the center, density is going to increase monotonically, right? So what happens to the trace? Initially, the trace begins to increase in absolute value uh, as we understand from the Newtonian limit, but as density becomes larger, uh, this picture changes and we can, uh, this, this relativistic contributions become important and we can have this pressure dominated phase, uh, I'm going to call it like that, where the, the trace um, is positive, right? And I already uh, uh, mentioned that, but maybe uh, it's worthwhile to emphasize that this property is not universal for, for any equation of state. And here you have an example, this H4 equation of state, uh, for the most massive neutral star allowed, it does not allow for a pressure uh, dominated phase. Um, so it's, it really depends on how stiff the equation of state is at the core of the neutron star. So in our work, we are going to, to uh, study this equilibrium properties of neutron stars with this pressure dominated cores, uh, as well as their stability under radio perturbations. So our primary goal here uh, was not to focus on, on like the possibility of constraints to any particular model, but to reveal some different phenomenology uh, that may arise uh, for these for this stars. So we focused on those two models that I uh, told you before. We were going to consider the also additional models, but then my daughter was born, Bernardo had to defend his thesis and uh, chaos began. Uh, so we had to cut short. Uh, so we focus on these two models, uh, the chameleon model of Weltman and Kuhi, as well as this environmentally dependent Dilaton model, which, as you'll see, display a quite, quite, display a quite different phenomenology. Uh, also, a main goal of this, of this work was to clarify by this full radio perturbation or stability analysis some claims that had, done bef uh, had been done before in the literature, um, where it was argued that these neutron stars with this unscreened cores uh, would be unstable. And this was done uh, by more or less hand-wavingly. So we wanted to, to clarify that, that issue. And indeed, we are going to find that these stars with partially unscreened cores uh, can be stable uh, under radio perturbations. So let me show you some results. So I'll, I'll begin with the chameleon uh, model. So here, I'm just so here I'm showing um, the scalar field profile uh, for the chameleon model around a neutron stars described by this H4 equation of state, which I, I mentioned, as I mentioned previously, uh, does not allow a pressure dominated phase inside any stable, uh, hydrodynamically stable star. Uh, and these several curves then correspond to several values of the central density of the star with central density increasing as we go from violet uh, to, to red. So what we can see here is that for very low central densities like the violet curve, the star is actually unscreened. Uh, the scalar field has this large gradient. We do not find the thin shell uh, effect. And indeed, if we were to compute uh, properties of these stars, they would be very different from general relativity. However, as we increase uh, the central density, we find the appearance of this typical thin shell uh, pattern. And if we were to compute properties then of those stars, they would be very close to general relativity. Um, okay, so however, when we, we consider an equation of state uh, that allows for this pressure dominated phase inside some stable stars, what we see is that as soon as the trace becomes positive in some region of the stellar interior, uh, the scalar field gets reactivated in the center. So uh, I think it's worthwhile to note that all realistic equations of state are just going to predict this, this uh, um, pressure dominated phase inside the, the inner core, right? So the scalar field we see here is still suppressed at the outer core and the crust of the neutron star. However, uh, global properties such as the neutron star mass or uh, mode frequencies, they, they can see the interior and therefore they can be uh, modified. 
so, so here I'm going to show you, um, so I'm showing to you some equilibrium uh, curves, uh, mass rest and radius relations for some uh, equations of state. Uh, the black curve in each plot uh, corresponds to general relativity, and these black dots here, uh, they indicate where along this, this general relativistic uh, sequence, the trace first becomes positive. So it's where the trace is zero at the center of the star. Um, okay, and here I'm showing uh, you uh, the results for the Camille model and three values of this parameter nu, uh, which enters in the potential. And here, maybe I should pause uh, to remark that these values uh, in these plots are quite far away from the realistic range of values. So indeed, equivalence principle uh, tests, they constrain this parameter nu to be orders of magnitude below what we are able to achieve numerically. So the, the problem is, is the following. Uh, so in order to construct the solutions, uh, we basically implement this shooting method, right, where we enforce uh, uh, asymptotic, an asymptotic condition uh, by changing the, the central value of the scalar field. And what happens is that as we decrease the value of this parameter nu, an extreme level of fine tuning becomes necessary as nu is decreased, right? So here I'm showing you uh, the field profile as a function of r uh, for three solutions which differ by a, a ridiculously small amount. So if we try to go below that, uh, we, we, we just can't, we can't uh, do that. Uh, however, even that being the case, and this is why I'm showing you these plots, uh, I believe the, the, that the mass radius relation here that we find uh, that are shown for the lower value of mu shown in these plots uh, should not be uh, very different from the one uh, with realistic, with the re realistic, uh, uh, the realistic range of values, and the reason I'm saying this is that as we decrease this value of mu, uh, we clearly see that the curves approach this limiting curve, and this limiting curve agrees with general relativity. So, as you see, right, as you proceed from blue to to uh, orange to red, uh, if we go to this limiting curve, which agrees to, uh, with general relativity for low densities but between, uh, begins to differ or to, to deviate from general relativity as soon as we cross this point where the trace is, is, uh, becomes positive and we have this pressure dominated phase. Uh, one consequence of this, of this fact then is that uh, we have this, uh, in this comedian model, uh, a, a total mass, right, a maximal mass of a neutron star uh, is, is smaller than in general relativity. But the difference, as you can see from this plot, is small. Uh, for these equations of state is of the order of a few percent, not very big. So an important question that we wanted to also address, as I told you, regards the stability of the solutions. So in this work, we performed this full uh, radio stability analysis. Uh, and what we uh, found, basically uh, not, nothing very, very remarkable. So we found no evidence of uh, unstable modes uh, prior to the turning point. Uh, in each of these uh, curves. So at the maximum mass for each of these curves, uh, so, so sorry, here I'm showing the, the inverse of the instability time scale for these unstable modes as a function of total mass. So what you see is that at the turning point here, we find uh, this marginally stable mode where this frequency here is zero, right? And as we go beyond uh, the turning point, uh, to the left of the turning point, uh, we find the presence of unstable modes. Uh, with the time scale, the, the stability time scale decreasing as we proceed along this curve. And uh, you can see that um, the behavior for the chameleon model is very similar to general relativity, uh, just displaced a little bit to the left because here we have a, a lower uh, maximum mass. So uh, we find then that stable uh, neutron stars with these unscreened cores uh, can exist in the in the chameleon model. Okay, so so now uh, let me move uh, to a different model that also shows a very different uh, phenomenology. So as I told you uh, before, we are going to consider this environmentally dependent uh, dilaton model, uh, which was formulated in this paper by, by Brax et al. Uh, it has again this quadratic coupling function and exponential potential. Um, and this, this uh, phi, big phi here, just uh, makes the, the transition between the, the, the form they write, the string-inspired effective action, the, and the representation that we are using in this work. 
Okay, so here we have a couple of three parameters. This V0 uh, is typically set by the dark energy uh, uh, density scale. And in order for screening to be effective in this model, we need A2 to be large for lambda here of order one. So again, uh, here there's no problem uh, regarding um, uh, this fine tuning. Uh, we can, we can um, move the parameters as we, as we want. So again, uh, here I'm showing you some field profiles for different values of the central density uh, for this H4 equation of state that does not allow this pressure dominated phase inside any stable star. And again, what we see is this uh, thin shell mechanism in place. So as density increases, the field profile becomes super flat in the stellar interior, just differs from, the gradient just differs from zero around uh, the stellar radius. And if we were to compute uh, uh, structural properties of these stars, it would be very close uh, to general relativity. However, when we have stars with this pressure dominated course, uh, we have a very different and, and rich uh, behavior. So I'm going to show you this in a, in a different way. So this plot shows the central value of the scalar field as a function of the central density of the star. So as we increase the central density uh, to the point where it exceeds uh, uh, the threshold, so that this pressure dominated phase appears. So this, uh, I don't know if you can see, yes, you can. So this is indicated by this uh, vertical line here. What we see is a dramatic change in, in behavior. So uh, uh, as we move along uh, this initial sequence of solutions uh, past this point, we find the sudden amplification of the scalar field content, which can raise by orders of magnitude uh, above the, the, the asymptotic value. And as density increases further, what we see is the, uh, the appearance of new branches of equilibrium solutions. Uh, so we have this very, very rich behavior, which is uh, remin reminiscent of the, what, what we find uh, in spontaneous colorization. So this is another, the top plot here is the same thing, just in a log plot, so that you can see maybe the, the behavior more clearly. Uh, and, and below we have the total mass as a function of the, of the central density. Uh, so these new solutions, they are characterized by an increasing number of nodes. Uh, so just try to have an idea of what they look like. If we fix the central density here at 10 times the nuclear saturation density, uh, we find 11 equilibrium solutions. And here is what they, they look like, right? So uh, we have one solution with a zero node, uh, which was uh, in this plot indicated by this black uh, sequence. Uh, and we find two solutions. So, so in this case, the syntotic value is positive. So the solution has one node, this also has one node. So we have two solutions with one node, two solutions with two nodes, and so on and so forth, up to five nodes for this, uh, for this central density. Uh, and in terms of global properties, uh, it is the branch of solutions with no nodes together with its twin, right? Uh, this guy here with one node and larger central uh, value, uh, which uh, whose properties uh, deviate most from general relativity. So perhaps th this is better seen in this plot. So here we have a, a mass radius diagram, right? For this Eng equation of state. General relativity, uh, you can see it all the way through, but it is this gray curve here, you see? So the the black and, and uh, purple, dashed purple solutions are those two. They, they, they deviate most from GR. And the higher node solutions, they are going to accumulate around uh, the general relativity uh, curve, right? So um, next, I think it's, it's really crucial also to understand uh, the stability of the solutions. And here we also perform this full radio stability analysis and did not find any evidence of these unstable modes prior to the turning point in this mass radius diagram. Of course, for those solutions uh, with a very high number of nodes that appear already beyond uh, the, 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 the turning point in the GR curve, they are, are, are fully unstable. Uh, but for those who have a, a turning point, they can have a, a stable uh, piece under this radio uh, perturbations. So again, here I'm showing uh, the, the inverse of the instability time scale as a function of, of the mass uh, for the solutions found previously. 
And again, uh, the solution that deviates most uh, from, from uh, general activity is the one uh, with no nodes. Uh, you see as in the chameleon model that the difference in the total mass here, in the maximal mass, is, is also small. And this is curious because the scalar field has this very dramatic uh, behavior, right? Uh, it, it really changes like my orders of magnitude, but still this, this uh, uh, the mass of the solution is still very close to general activity. So when we go uh, to higher, higher uh, no, uh, solutions to a higher number of, of nodes, uh, we see that not only there are structural properties, but also the frequencies of these unstable modes, they tend to general activity, as you can see in this plot. Okay, so um, although we find that these solutions with higher number of nodes, they seem to be dynamically stable under radio perturbations, uh, we can also address the thermodynamical uh, stability. Uh, so if we compute, for instance, uh, fixing the baryon mass, the total baryon mass of the solution, the total, if we compute the, the total mass of these different uh, solutions, what we see is that the solution with no nodes uh, has a lower total mass and is therefore thermodynamically preferred over the remaining solutions. Uh, but this does not seem to be connected to a dynamical instability, at least for, for these radio perturbations. So in this Dilaton model, we can also find uh, stable stars with this unscreened uh, cores, uh, this spontaneous, -like, uh, spontaneous colorization-like behavior, and the presence of these additional solutions that, that might, be, might be interesting. Okay, so just to, to discuss a little bit some perspectives here. Um, so I, I, here, here we focused on these uh, radio perturbations. Uh, the interest we had uh, was because of the information they provide about instability or stability. But stable radio modes are also quite interesting, especially in scalar tensor theories, uh, where they, these modes can propagate uh, in the form of scalar waves. So something that we are working, uh, uh, looking at is to compute this stable uh, radio quasi-normal modes numerically. And the reason this might be promising is the following. So a couple of years ago, together with uh, Nestor Ortiz, we were studying this uh, radio quasi-normal modes in classes of massless uh, scalar tensor theories that show this effect of spontaneous colorization. And we found something interesting. So here, uh, it, it's, you can just focus on the left here. So here I'm showing the frequency as a function of the compactness for the fundamental radio mode and its first overtone. General relativity is the, the, the uh, dark gray curve. Uh, and uh, this red curve corresponds to the, this massless scalar tensor theory that we were studying in this paper. Uh, it just differs from general relativity in a finite range of compactness where this effect of spontaneous colorization uh, takes place. So what I wanted to, to draw attention here, so here is the case of, for this plot I chose uh, 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 the model parameters uh, to be such that structural properties for these colorized solutions are very close to general relativity. Uh, and also their mode frequencies are very, are very uh, similar to GR. Right, and then we come back to that first uh, to, the, to the something that I mentioned in the beginning. So this light uh, gray curves in this plot, they 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 just show the same um, the, the the frequency of this uh, fundamental radio mode for different equations of state. Right, so I'm just changing the equation of state, keeping GR, and what you see is this degeneracy between this equation of state effects. So this this modification here, due to strong gravity, is completely blurred into the uncertainty that we have uh, about the nuclear equation of state. Uh, so in this paper, uh, uh, um, we, we found something, something interesting. So this is not the, the complete story. Um, so what happens here is that, so this shows how this GR fluid modes get modified by this uh, scalar field. However, whenever you have new degrees of freedom uh, in your theory, uh, it's also possible that new families of modes uh, may arise, which are not gravitational-led or uh, fluid-led, but are instead, in this case, like scalar-led. And they might have interesting properties. So in this case, in particular, we found this new family of modes that we call like high modes, uh, which appears at low frequencies, which is always interesting from the point of view of, of detection. 
uh, and they are reasonably separated. Uh, this is the, the main point. They are reasonably separated from the GR mode frequencies, so that this may allow for a clear, uh, clear detection. So we want to to this is this is a, an example of of where structural properties can be very similar to GR. Some fluid frequencies, some some modes can be close to GR, but still the full spectrum may be different. So what we are trying to do now is to study uh, this the same thing for the scalar tensor theories, not not with uh, with uh, potentials that are uh, inspired by these uh, screening uh, models. Uh, and, and I think this might find something similar in that case, especially for the Dilaton model, which has this, this uh, resemblance to spontaneous colorization. Uh, and I mean, there are other things that we are thinking of, and I would be super glad to, to hear your thoughts on that. So this was super short. Uh, I always speak, I, I, I plan for a one hour talk and I just cut every time like 15 minutes. I should plan for a, a larger talk. So that's, that's it. Thanks, Raisa. Thanks, very, Miguel. Nice, very nice talk. So now the question round. Is there any question? I, I have a question, Miguel. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, so Miguel. if I understood well, in the um, so you have multiple. So you said you have multiple for given mass and radius. Uh, you can have multiple solutions which are all linearly stable. But then you, you, you think only one of them is the, the real one because it has the lowest energy. Is that what you, you were saying? And yes. So does that mean that then the higher energy solutions are, uh, are, non -linear, are, are um, unstable at the nonlinear yes. level? So <coughs> I'm not sure. So this is, this, this is something we should we could uh, think of. But uh, the, the difference in total mass uh, from, from the solutions is very, very small. Uh, okay. So uh, it, it uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. So here we studied just the radio dynamical stability for radio modes. And we find that this, these are stable. Uh, and their masses are all very, very similar. The difference is very small. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps this could point uh, to some sort of nonlinear uh, instability. Mm -hmm. um, well, this seems like in quantum mechanics when you have the energy levels of hydrogen and you have the, for different uh, wave functions, the lower the energy, the, the lower the number of nodes in the wave function, right? So yes. maybe there's a mathematical reason, it's a boundary value problem. Yes, so. Um, it, it, yeah, so we, we, also, we also have this. this uh, uh, this, this is the first time that I studied this uh, series of screening mechanisms, but we have a, a bunch of uh, many works on this massless scalar tensor theories. Mm -hmm. And we have this, this uh, also like numerical code for in spherical symmetry, uh, which could be interesting to, to see what's the end, if we start with those solutions, uh, yeah. what's the end state of their evolution. So yeah. probably uh, they're going to be uh, maybe stable for a long uh, uh, period, right? Mm -hmm. But perhaps at later times they're going to decay to this uh, mass, uh, to this nodeless uh, solution. Yeah, or if you keep them strong enough, maybe they would just uh, yes, yes, yes. Just transition to another solution. Okay. Uh, and sure. I also have another, well, more general question. Uh, so, so you you're focusing on this class or, or these two classes or, or class of current tensor theories, but as you were saying in the beginning, there are other. Uh, models or uh, other yes. theories that give screening, and all of them feature um, more yes. like conformal coupling to matter. How how yes. general do you do you feel this effect is? Uh, I think this will be very general. Uh, yeah. So so my guess is that uh, it, it, I was I was perhaps a little bit surprised that I was thinking that considering different theories, we would find maybe. Well, it's the same phenomenology. You see, like when the trace becomes positive, we, the scalar field reactivates as if we had a very low density environment inside the neutron star. Uh, however, when we were studying this Dilaton model, so we had the plan to, to consider other models here, but then uh, it, it took us a lot of time to understand uh, what was happening in this Dilaton model. Uh, and, and you see that the, the, the behavior can be very different. So uh, we, we uh, so I, I think that generically we will have some some different behavior, um, 
perhaps in some theories this would lead to, to more like measurable quantities than others. Perhaps the phenomenology is going to be different. It's something uh, uh, typically happens when, when this, this, this occurs. So even in, in what you were studying, right, in this K-essence uh, theory, you also have like this coupling to the You have this change of side. It's, well, it's you, different there. I don't have much intuition, it, but... Yeah, we can have a, yeah, we were thinking about that as well. Maybe yeah. we have a conversation later. Yes, we... I don't have much intuition about that, but but uh, I think uh, it's it's probable that, that something uh, can, can happen. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's really interesting. I mean, because like, uh, uh, well, it might uh, of course be that uh, the stars do not exist in nature, well, and I, even I guess, if they do, mm -hmm. but I guess there would be a minimum threshold, right? If you if you just have a change in sign in the in the in a very small region in the center, um, I mean, there might be a critical value of uh, yes it, it might be that the, the, the there's like you just need let me move to the first. Uh, the first plot there uh, might be that the equation of state only allows for this uh, 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 stars uh, with a very limited range of masses, right? And so th they would be really special systems and maybe hard to to detect. Uh, but I think it's interesting, like from from uh, to consider that to consider that the things so, might exist. The equation of state, the realistic equation of state, that gives the strongest uh, effect. Maybe you said it, but I. I uh... um, so so, uh, we can we can approach this in several ways. So so we can uh, uh, work uh, in in like uh, tables of, of uh, tables provided by this, those models, uh, and there are some like in, in the the. So you want a very uh, steep equation of state. You said uh, in the core, yeah. So you don't need it to be steep all the way. So for instance, this this. Uh, Tidal deformability measurements uh, that LIGO uh, made, uh, they m mostly constrain the outer core in the surface. You still can have equations of state that, that have a, a, they're soft in the exterior and still are stiff enough in the, in the interior. So your question was, what's the best equation of state? So if you, if you allow me like a, a, a parameterized uh, way to write the equation of state, maybe we can adjust the parameters so that they have maximum, uh, uh, maximum effect. But uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, equations of state that come from, from nuclear physics, it's more or less like always like the ones that I showed you, uh, that I showed you here. So uh, maybe this MPA1 MPA. is one that, that gives a, um, the biggest a, strong, a strong effect, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Enrico. Alexandru? Yes, I have a couple of other questions. Actually, more, but I'll try to summarize to go to. Uh, so first of, first of all, thanks for the nice uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. Too. Thanks. And then, um, so about this uh, limit with uh, mu going to zero, with the yeah. disappearing parameter in the chameleon potential, um, why uh, do you have an intuition of why is it giving uh, this uh, fine-tuning problem for uh, for the bisection of the of the scalar solution outside. Um, yes, here. So yeah. So I mean, what if, happens if is that you goes to very small values, you should approach like um, not general relativity. You should sorry. You should yeah. approach not in general relativity because you still have the conformal coupling. But um, I mean, I don't see. I don't see. Yeah, so numerically, what we see is that so the solutions become extremely flat inside the star and outside the star. So we have this thin shell mechanism operating in its, its uh, uh, strongest form, uh, and and this is basically why. So you you have a very uh, uh, sharp uh, behavior. Um, I don't know, like physically, if there's and this is not, I think, something restricted to this shooting algorithm. Uh, there was uh, this previous paper uh, that um, I guess even in, even the paper by uh, I'm not sure now in the paper by Langlois and and, and Labichet, uh, but also in, in a paper that followed that they use this uh, relaxation uh, algorithm to compute the solutions and right. still uh, the the lowest they, they don't do uh, an analysis like this but still I guess the lowest they can go is 
is uh, higher than the one that we achieved. So we had to use this this package where we have arbitrary precision and even so we we try to 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 put uh, we we computed some curves with a, a lower value than than that than the one that's displayed that but just for a few right and this is this is what I was saying so it, it tends to gr for lower densities and uh, deviates. It really seems that we are approaching uh, 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 some some limiting curve, uh, but this is, I mean, a conjecture. We can't really uh, mm -hmm. move uh, all the way there. So, but you don't think it's but, it's also due because of the um, what you're saying is that okay. Go ahead. You're choosing a. Uh, I, I read your paper, and uh, you, you're choosing a negative pressure uh, atmosphere outside of these stars, right? With yes. a constant density that's small typically yes. uh don't you think is the i mean is this a, a fine-tuning problem so that. finding this the, the the proper asymptotic value of the field outside of the star may be due also to the choices of the atmosphere you're doing so can we, we improve on this with choosing different atmospheres maybe sorry yes so we we uh, did the same calculation for for putting just dust outside so just for, for maybe people who didn't uh, read the paper, uh, in the chameleon model, uh, we need to put some some um, ambient density outside the star so that the scale, the, the, the effective potential has a minimum outside and uh, the, we can have the correct asymptotic behavior. So uh, we just uh, put some, some um, like cosmological fluid there with uh, an equation of state like minus one. Uh, but we also tried with dust and the problem uh, remains there. Um, okay. So, but, but we didn't investigate that uh, uh, further. Uh, I mean, this, this, uh, we maybe read in all of these previous papers that uh, they, they had some values for this parameter, which were so uh, large and all of them, them complaining about numerics that we just tried to do our best and, yeah. and we didn't explore this further, uh, but yeah. Um, I don't know, uh, like the density that we impose outside is, is, is large, we could try to decrease that. Uh, so we have tried uh, some things, if Bernardo were here, he would, would tell you uh, more about that. But um, uh, so for some choices, we could uh, uh, lower a little bit from what we show in the plots, but not significantly, you know, there, there wasn't something that was, oh, this is the problem, if you do this, we're going to be able to achieve uh, that value for me. I see. Thanks. Yeah, I don't have like an intuition uh, for really for for why. I, I don't expect this uh, like being anything. Uh, I think this is just an, a numerical issue. Sure, uh, sure. I think we. Uh, this is my guess. My guess is that we are really seeing this limiting curve, and if we were able to push all the way to the realistic range of values, we should uh, converge to something like that. Thanks. Is there any question? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you for your talk, first of all. Thank you. Um, so my question is about uh, these diagrams exactly. So if I understood correctly, you uh, were determining whether a solution is stable or not by looking at the maximum right, of the mass radius uh, ratio. Uh, not quite. So we. Uh, we have this, I didn't put any equations here. So we did this radio uh, perturbation analysis. So we, we computed, uh, so we perturb everything, perturb the fluid, uh, the, 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 the metric functions, the scalar field, and we work out the equations to linear order in these perturbations. And we look for unstable solutions of those perturbations. So we are looking for, numerically, we, we are looking for unstable uh, radio modes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we find is something similar to what happens in GR, right? That uh, this a thermodynamic instability that is, is implied by this turning point actually coincides uh, with the dynamic, uh, dynamical instability to gravitational collapse. So here, the same thing seems to be, to be present. Uh, so uh, we can't, uh, it's, it's numerical, so we can't really say that, but, but it's very close, very close to the maximal mass. We find this uh, uh, marginally stable mode, and then beyond that, we find unstable modes with this 
um, uh, instability timescales. So it's not just by looking at the plots and saying, well, well turning point uh, 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 theorem should be valid here as well. Mm -hmm. We try to compute really the radio perturbations. I don't know if that's, that, that was your question. Yeah, exactly. That was my question. Why, why you think, well, the question was more, why do you think uh, that these points coincide? Because normally yeah. in scalar density theories, you would have to consider the scalar profile as well, right? And it might shift. Yes. So maybe, maybe uh, I don't know, maybe in Hiko someone can, can tell me if there are, so I know, I know very well in GR, like the proofs of this uh, turning point theorems and why they relate to the thermodynamic instability that, implied, that is implied by this turning point uh, in general relativity. But I, 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 I think I never saw uh, uh, a paper that proves, uh, no, so maybe there was one paper by Harada. Yeah, there is a paper by Harada. Uh, by Harada, yes, who proves in the massless, is, yes, yes. It's not enough. Using this catastrophe theory where they, they prove uh, this for, but it's a very different kind of proof from the one that I, uh, by the Sok Sokin and, and, and Friedman uh, uh, a proof in GR. They use this catastrophe theory to show that indeed we have this, this uh, the same, the same uh, turning point criterion valid in this case. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, uh, I don't have an argument why it should be valid in general. Uh, that's the only paper that came to my mind where they uh, show this in, in, in some way. But I think this is, is uh, uh, very common. So there, there should be, uh, there should be a way to maybe to show this and I think this, this even would be interesting to, to see if there's a, 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 I don't know if there is, so if there is a, 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 a more or less general way to, to prove in scalar density theories that this, this condition is valid, um, that we have a, a thermodynamic instability of, uh, beyond the, the turning point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think it's not worth the question, but I, I would like to make a question, but just yes, like, a, what is your feeling about um, about if you take a binary of neutron star with this screen or a screen star, what is your feeling that in, you will see something different in the gravitational wave? We will see the same or, I don't know, just your feeling, maybe it's a silly question. Sure, sure. I think that, uh, well, the way that I like to think about it, uh, is not consider uh, that one of these stars with unscreen cores is in the binary because this would have to be a very massive star. Uh, but maybe uh, when these two normal neutron stars collide and, and collapse, uh, this 1.4 reason natural neutron stars collide, they are going to, f to form this very heavy star, uh, which might display this property. So when I, when I, I think about gravitational waves, I think that uh, maybe a, a nice way to look uh, at this uh, would be in the post-merger phase. So whether there could be some, some uh, uh, if we detected the, 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 the frequencies, right, uh, of, the, of this oscillating body, the post-merger uh, remnant, uh, whether they could, they could be, um, they could have influence of this, of this effect. And so, so there is this possibility, at which we, we are studying now for this class of, of theories that I mentioned to you before. So let me just go to the, to the end here. Um, so, so um, you know, like in general, in general relativity, when you, uh, the, 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 this, this remnant is, is a very complicated object. Uh, so people believe that they can say from, from numerical relativity simulations that uh, the, the peak frequency is at the, the fundamental uh, quadricolor mode, uh, but they can see uh, nonlinear couplings between this uh, quadrupolar uh, oscillation and the radio oscillation, because this guy is also oscillating very, very radially, very uh, violently. Uh, so in GR, they can see from these numerical simulations the presence of these nonlinear couplings to the radio uh, to the radio uh, fundamental radio mode of these stars. So something that I, uh, I'm, I'm also uh, working on, but in the context of this massless scalar tensor theories, uh, is to ask the same question, um, whether this new phi modes, you know, because uh, they could be detected, not, not directly, uh, but uh, through their non-linear coupling uh, with uh, the, the, the other modes of the star. So, 
we are not doing this uh, now in, in generality, in like three, three dimensional uh, simulations, but in one dimensional, like spherically symmetric uh, simulations, um, to see if we can see at least uh, a strong coupling, a nonlinear coupling between the spy modes and the other radio modes. Uh, this would be uh, uh, indicate that maybe it's worthwhile to look at this. So I think that when we think about gravitational waves, maybe it's worthwhile to think about the the, the remnant. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, this is this is something that I have been thinking about. But but maybe also in the spiral we can we can think about uh, uh, something. Um, it's, it's it's harder, right? Because the spiral like tidal deformability. I I think it's not going to probe this. Um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that. So, yeah, yes. I think it's enough question. Thanks a lot, Rice, again for. Thank uh, you, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a, a great pleasure to, to talk to you. Um, uh, thanks to you for the talk. Uh, I hope we can host you in person sometime. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>